I'm going to modify my speech somewhat. For that, we have uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, to thank for having stirred a virtual firestorm in suggesting that uh, the Sharia uh, might well have to be accommodated in the United Kingdom. And uh, I would imagine that some of you have come inspired by that very controversy, in addition to whatever else was, is being floated out there uh, with regard to the Sharia. Today I will do the following. Uh, one is um, define the Sharia for you, uh, secondly, talk of its application uh, in the Muslim past and the present. Thirdly, look at the Sharia in the West. And finally, look at some objectionable, aspe objectionable aspects of the Sharia, at least from a secular perspective. To begin with, the Sharia is defined loosely as Islamic law. And that in itself creates the problems that Muslims face today, as well as non-Muslims. Translating the word Sharia to mean Islamic law does little to provide the richness that the word itself encompasses as well as its historicity to the audience. So what we will do today is, at least at the outset, make the distinction between the Sharia and its application. And then, to facilitate discussion, we'll simply use the term loosely, even though I've already pointed out that such usage creates more problems than provides solutions. The Sharia in Islamic law, in, in, in the philosophy that undergirds Islamic law, is a cosmic ideal. It is perfect. It is complete. And it is utterly unattainable. Once again, as far as Islamic law is concerned, in its philosophical dispensation, the Sharia is complete, perfect, and utterly unattainable. Because it is how God wants the world configured. Because it is what God, or as Muslims, or Arabic-speaking people actually use the term Allah, has in mind for humanity. It is to that extent therefore cosmic. And because it is divine, it is therefore perfect as well. It is complete because its designer is the omniscient God. So this is that ideal Sharia towards which every Muslim ought to aspire, but whose ultimate accomplishment is forever elusive. The process of determining in human terms what God wants of us is known as fiqh. And the law that Muslims have practiced in the past and try to practice today has been and will always be an approximation of the Sharia. It is an approximation of the Sharia. One uses the process known as fiqh to try and determine in human historicized terms what is it that God really wants of us? We have some pointers in his sacred book, for Muslims that is, the Quran, but they are no more than that, pointers. Every element of 
Islam's legal system is actually a synthesis of both the divine and the human. Scholars in the past have, and scholars today still do, use their intellect to determine what God wants of human beings, Muslims specifically, by way of the Quran. But in the process, they historicize the text, contextualize the text, they embellish the text. That process of historicizing, contextualizing, embellishing is known as fiqh, a term not commonly understood outside Islamic scholarly circles. So for today, the first thing we learn is that Sharia is divine ideal and what God wants of us out there and our approximation of that in this terrestrial life through the process known as fiqh is an approximation of that Sharia. So to that extent, it will always follow a moving target and will always remain imperfect. Now moving on to the application of the Sharia among Muslims in the past and the present. Islam is not a religion that has advocated or experimented with the separation of church and state. There was no context in the past that necessitated the separation of the two. There was no Rome that had control over Jerusalem and that forced Jesus to say, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is, which is God's. Islam begins within a homogenous ethnic community in Arabia, not governed by any imperial power, even though two major powers existed to the north of it, and was thus able to establish a social framework that required legal jurisdiction. And thus the Sharia became law. If circumstances had been different, if there was indeed a Rome that had colonized Arabia, then who knows? There might well have been, at its very genesis, talk, if not actual implementation of a separation of the sacred and the profane. But from its very inception, there was no need to separate the sacred and the profane. From that Arabian melting pot emerged a civilization and a colonizing power that took control of much of the known world at the time. And within 100 years, the religion that was Islam became a civilizational cultural phenomenon all the way from what is now Bangladesh to Spain. That particular religion, which had become a civilization and a colonizing power, required a legal framework to conduct the affairs of its people, Muslim and non-Muslim. And so through the process of fiqh, a legal structure was established. And all those who lived within that community, Muslim and non-Muslim, were governed by that legal structure, Islamic law or as we now loosely use, it, use the term, the Sharia. So the Sharia has always been a living part of the Muslim community, both at the individual as well as at the, at the political level, for Muslims as well as for non-Muslims. Jews who lived within Islamdom were governed in their public life by the Sharia that was Islamic. But that same Sharia insisted that in their private lives, 
in their family law, for instance, in, their law, in the laws pertaining to marriages and divorces, then they will necessarily follow Judaic law or Mosaic law. And thus began this system that is still prevalent in some parts of the world where religion, one particular religion, becomes the foil of society at large and particular religions are then given space to exercise some aspects of their law within that greater milieu. So it is important to understand that particular history in order to make sense one of the relevance of Islamic law to Muslims today and, and, and two, its pervasiveness, pervasiveness. Muslims still consider it relevant beyond the personal domain and one finds it present in the strangest of places. And that brings me to the Sharia today. The Sharia in the world, and again, Sharia, I, by Sharia I mean Islamic law in, in any of its manifestations, is far more prevalent than the ruckus that was kicked up as a consequence to the Archbishop's comments seemed to indicate. That particular incident seemed to indicate that this is firstly an Eastern alien oddity and one that was archaic, if not moribund, and one that had so many imperfections in it that it need not be resurrected. I say to you today that it is, it may well be an oddity to those who've never heard of it or seen it in practice. It may well be archaic to those who have little understanding of its complexities. But it is a phenomenon that is found in many, many parts of the world. When the British colonized South Asia, which is today India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, they perpetuated the Sharia and tinged it with a Western flavor. Remember what we said earlier on, that Islam created a system for societies that were pluralistic and allowed different communities within those societies to exercise their particular laws in keeping with their religious requirements. The British did the same. So you had in South Asia the imperial legal system being the British system. Foreign affairs was conducted according to the British system. The Muslims had colonized India, and so until, until the British came in, their, their legal system determined international law. For India, that is. But with the advent of the British, the Sharia was replaced by British law, by English law. And within that English legal system, Hindu law was exercised, Muslim law was exercised, and to the extent that they existed in that particular part of the world, and there, there, there are still some, Judaic law or Mosaic law was exercised. And when India gained independence and was partitioned into Muslim India and Hindu India, Hindu India perpetuated the same system. So today, you have a secular foil that is in India's legal system. But within that legal system, there is a domain that is exclusive to Hindus. And their marriages, divorces, and laws of succession are determined by Hindu law. Muslim laws of succession, marriage, and divorces are determined by Islamic law. These are the two 
dominant religious systems that are operational within a secular legal system in India. And this, is, this might sound strange to people who live in Switzerland, where you have ethnic, cultural, and historical homogeneity. So the idea of any legal system foreign coming in is hugely problematic. But if the world is becoming truly global, and this is becoming a melting pot, then Switzerland is not the future. Switzerland is not the future. Lebanon is the future, perhaps. In Lebanon, you have a legal system that is constitutionally secular and operationally religious. There are 11 different legal systems, religious legal systems, that are operative within the country that is Lebanon. So you have, within Islam, you have Sunni, Shiite, and Druze. Within Christianity, you have Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant. Then you have Judaic, and so on. You have, within that one country, you could be married and divorced according to 11 different systems. Which is, uh, which is not to say that they live in perfect harmony with each other, and that their human rights are better preserved and celebrated in that way. It is simply to say that human beings elsewhere have been dealing with the problem of cultural and ethnic pluralities in different ways and long before the problem found itself on the shores of the United States or the United Kingdom. Religious pluralism was a reality that Islam addressed at its very beginnings. The interesting thing about the Sharia and its connection to the sacred text, because this is a, 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 a religion of the book, and it, and, it, and it defines people of other faiths as those who belong to the family of the religion of the books or those who do not. So Christians are, are, are part of a single family. Jews are part of a single family. Muslims are part of that same family. And what family is that? The family of the Ahlul Kitab. The people of the book. And so for them, therefore, and more so for Muslims, the book becomes more than the bedrock. It becomes the point of departure for any kind of activity, social or otherwise. And so when one, one traces the origins of the word Sharia in the book itself, one finds that it speaks and uses the terms not to define Islamic law interestingly, but to, but to accommodate religious pluralism. In one part of the Quran, it says, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْ هَاجَةً وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكُمْ لَجَمْعًا لَهَدَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا He says, unto each community, we have set aside, established a peculiar, particular way of life. A legal system, if the word shir'a, shari'a, shir'a, you can hear you can hear the similarity. And if God had so wanted, and if your Lord had so wanted, then all of you, all humanity would be following but one way. This is clear, unmistakable evidence from the text itself that Islam is a religion that doctrinally endorses, encourages, and accommodates religious pluralism. And if one looks at the other verses of the Quran in which the word Sharia is used, either directly or indirectly, then one finds similarly 
that it speaks not of a legal system peculiar to Muslims, but it speaks about different paths that different people use and the need to respect those different paths. This is why I said at the outset that using the word sharia as a synonym for Islamic law obfuscates more than it clarifies. It clouds the, more than it elucidates. But because the term is now perhaps slightly less prevalent than the word jihad from within the Islamic lexicon, we have no choice but to use it also loosely to define Islamic law. How prevalent is Islamic law in the West? Well, there are countries apart from South Asia where Islamic law is operational in one way or the other. Islamic law is operational in the United Kingdom. Islamic law is operational in France to, to a lesser extent. Islamic law is operational in the United States. Islamic law is operational in some other Western countries. And this might come as a surprise to Muslims themselves. Because for the most part, we believe that the constitution of this country does not accommodate this kind of plurality. It does. And we'll explain that later. I'll give you three examples of how Islamic law in one form or the other is operational in these Western countries. One very, very popular commodity in the field of banking today is Islamic banking. Some of this country's most prominent banking organizations have embraced Islamic banking. Briefly speaking, Islamic banking is choose interest payments as we commonly understand the term. So if one were to go to an Islamic bank, one would not be allowed to invest or deposit $10,000 in the hope of receiving 2% or 5% as a fixed return on that. In Islamic banking, there must be shared liability and shared benefits. That's the key to understanding. It's, it's, it's obviously more complicated than that, but for brevity's sake, let's just restrict the distinction to the fact that in Islamic banking, one is not allowed to engage in any kind of a transaction if one's capital is uh, safeguarded from liability. There's a bank in Ann Arbor called the University Bank. It has an entire section. It's, it's, it's a bank that, that has been owned for generations by, by, by the people, by a family in, uh, a Christian family in, in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they have, uh, they have an entire department set aside for Islamic banking. So you have banks in, in the Western world that have Islamic banking portfolios. You can buy a car, you can buy a house, not in, in an Islamic institution, but in a secular institution, using Islamic banking principles, rules, and regulations. And it, it's such a growing phenomenon that major banks are seriously considering opening up portfolios that would deal exclusively with Islamic banking. With regard to the other example, you have Muslim family law. You have no choice but to accommodate people who come into this country from the Muslim world and are married, have had their marriages performed in, in, in accordance with Islamic law. So if you had people come in from Pakistan, for instance, or people coming from Malaysia, or people coming from Saudi Arabia, or from Egypt, then there is, their marriages have been performed according to Islamic law to a greater or lesser extent. 
When those marriages come to the United States, they bring with them certain contractual stipulations. And if, God forbid, that marriage is on the verge of dissolution, then those contractual stipulations become pertinent. And that matter becomes contentious and ends up in front of a, a, a judge in this country. And he has no recourse but to refer to Islamic law or at least to read into it, if not in the interest of, if not in keeping with, with American law, then at least in keeping with two things. What is known as the law of comity or just pure humanitarian needs. The law of comity is an, is an, an international understanding amongst nations that each nation's legal system would be recognized. If we decide not to recognize the legal system of Benin, because it's slightly bigger than the greater Miami area, for instance, then we could have serious problems because much of the world comprises of Benins. There are many, many small, insignificant countries. And we will, at some point in our existence, encounter some aspect of, law, of the law that is Benini. I think I'm right there. Uh, and, and therefore would have no choice but to recognize it. So that's the law of comity. It safeguards us because if, if, we, if we disrespect or, 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 or ignore someone else's national law, then we could very well have ours ignored as well. And then just pure humanitarianism, there's a judge sitting out there looking at this, he says, judge, according to Islamic law, this man had promised me, as part of the marital contract, when our marriage was performed, that he would give me 10,000 US dollars. Or, worse still, he would give me 10,000 rupees. Or, if she was smart enough, he would give me 10,000 pieces of the going currency in the country in which we live. You see three problems emerging, and they do. I, 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 if you have any interest in this, I would ask that you go and, go and look at LexisNexis and just, just do a search for talaq or look, do a search for mahar, and you'd be surprised at the number of marriages that end up in front of judges who have to decide what to do with the stipulation. Recognizing that stipulation is problematic because it is an implicit recognition of Islamic law, the Sharia, the dreaded Sharia. Not recognizing is problematic because it means that one of these, one of these parties is, is gaining an unlawful advantage, or if not that, then at least an immoral advantage because of migration. You have some very, very interesting developments because of people caught up in these marriages or these divorces. They're sometimes called lumping marriages, where a marriage is performed and recognized by both legal systems, but the divorce is only recognized by one legal system, the Islamic or the secular. As far as that individual is concerned, and it's generally a she, she is only half divorced. She is either divorced according to Islamic law, if she got, was able to get, to get that, or divorced according to secular law, if she was able to get that. It's rare that you would find someone living in this country involved in a contentious breakup, being divorced simultaneously with regard to both legal systems. This is an emerging problem that judges in this country are forced to address, whether they recognize, respect, or acknowledge the existence of the Sharia or not. And then we have Muslim culinary habits. The word kosher is, has, has become so much a part of our lexicon that we use it to speak about anything that is legal or acceptable. Now the Islamic equivalent of that is halal. And so if you go into some parts of this country, you would find there are signs outside saying the food produced, processed in this restaurant or in this particular establishment follows the diktats of, of halal. And that's going to be a growing phenomenon as well. And then you have slaughterhouses emerging. Slaughterhouses will have to follow two jurisdictions. One is 
the jurisdiction of, 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 of secular law within this country with regard to health and so on. And the other is according to Islamic law. For us, it's not too difficult to make this kind of accommodation. For the British as well, but that's, we are not in, in, in Great Britain and we are talking to an audience that, that looks at this as a, that a possible area of, 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 of concern. We already have in place a certain amount of accommodation for other religions who have had a longer historical relationship with us. In the state of New York, for instance, it is perfectly acceptable to have your marriage annulled, performed, you have your marital discord resolved according to Jewish law. Because Jews in the state of New York have a history, have been established there for generations, and have successfully argued and acquired certain legal rights that would not have been allowed if the, if the state had to define the separation of church and state with the strictness that we think actually exists out there. In Canada, ironically, Jewish law is given far greater prominence and acceptability. The problem, of, however, is that Muslim law is also used, and by this I mean the Sharia, uh, to justify the most egregious most barbaric of human rights violations that we see today. And having that kind of a law legitimized, accepted, and acknowledged within society is problematic for any person who is sensible and simply wants a society that follows civil standards. Decency precludes the acceptance of a legal system that allows the killing of people of other faiths simply because they belong to another faith. Extrajudicial killings and the kind of gory realities that are so often aligned with the name Islam and Muslims, this becomes a hurdle for anyone, even the most accommodating society to overlook. And that brings us to the issue of how do we deal with this abuse of Islamic law? For clearly it is an abuse of Islamic law. If Islamic law had been practiced and exercised as the bin Ladens of this world would have us practice it today, then there would not be 10 million Copts in Egypt. And there are at least that many cops in Egypt. Then there would not be as many Hindus as had been when India gained independence. Then there would not have been these minorities that have existed in the Muslim world for centuries. Then the Inquisition would have been an expulsion of Jews and Christians from Spain, and not an expulsion of Muslims and Jews by Christians. So it's important to understand that where no legal system or no authority exists, the individual, radical, demonic demagogue can very much determine how a legal system is defined and how it is implemented. But in, to be fair to the Sharia, it is important to look at it not narrowly as defined by the most blatant, most egregious, most inhuman manifestations of it in these small pockets that exist within the Muslim world today, but rather in that large swath that is Muslim history. Muslim history would reflect a Sharia that accommodated non-Muslims, a Sharia that espoused some of those values that we consider humane and civilized, and a Sharia that worked pretty well for much of its citizens for over 1,200 years. And so, in conclusion, 
it is important for us to be mindful of the fact that globalism is not a one-way street. You will not simply have McDonald's in Pakistan and uh, Colonel Sanders outside the Haram, by the way. Uh, if you've gone out there, you may have noticed that there's, there is um, a Kentucky outside the, the precincts of the, of, of the sacred mosque. And if you stand at that particular Kentucky, you can actually see the sacred mosque. So that's the kind of proximity. So that's the West leaking into Islamdom. The reverse is also happening. It is as troubling for Muslims to have Western ideas, Western icons, Western establishments cre create a presence in the Islamic world as much as it is for the British to even consider having Islamic law or elements thereof as part of their social structure. But it's inevitable. What we have to do is work towards a modus vivendi that would recognize the rights of people to live their lives in accordance with their consciences, but not to the detriment of any other individual's rights and, 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 and liberties. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. For our question and answer, we'll, if you can come to the mic, there will be a 30 second time limit, a 30 second time limit on the question and answer, I mean for the questions, excuse, excuse me. So if you can come to the mic with your questions, thank you. I enjoyed your lecture. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I enjoyed your lecture very much, the history and the logic of it. Uh, from most of what I heard, I believe you mentioned in this country as well as in Western Europe and in Asia, South Asia, that a Muslim subset or minority had preserved their rights within a secular form of government and legislation. I want to ask a slightly different take on it. I've heard, as have probably many of you, that in the United States, among the so-called founding fathers, Jefferson in particular, that he was more of a deist than a Trinitarian, more of a believer in one true God. And some of you might have even heard that he had a Quran in his possession. And I was wondering, is there any evidence in your research that you found that in common American law, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, there has been a leaking or influence of Islamic law within the greater American form of legislation and <clears throat> policy making from the get-go, or from at least 1776? Thanks. No, I don't. I, I, uh, I have a, a great interest in Islamic law and Islamic studies. And uh, look at Islamic law, uh, American law only to the extent that, that the one has an influence on the other. Uh, it, it's, it's not gone so far as to, to look for, uh, uh, for origins of ideas, uh, crossovers, uh, and so on. But uh, these things happen, uh, and, and it's, it's not unusual to find Hindu law having aspects of Islamic law or Muslim family law having aspects of British law and so on. Uh, there are clear examples in, within Islamic law of, of uh, either the Sasanian or the Eastern Roman legal system having an influence upon it, and it's still called Sharia. Uh, for instance, you have the, the judiciary in Islam, and the judge in, in, in Arabic is called the Qadi, and that certainly is an institution that can be traced to the text. But then you have a hierarchy of qadis, a juridical system, and you have qadi al qudat the supreme judge, or what we would call the supreme court. 
And that, and that system was adopted from, from secular societies. So societies have always and will always continue to borrow and lend to each other. And that is, in my opinion, uh, the bedrock of civilization. No civilization can claim to have created its monuments and its edifices by, by and of its own. It's, it's always this process, to use that term again, process of leakage. We all leak into each other. And thank God for that. For without it, we would not have all our great accomplishments. Uh, good evening. Jazakallah khair for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is, when we talk about Sharia law, do we talk about something uniform across different countries, or are there differences between Sharia law implemented in, these, in the different Muslim countries? My second question would be, how would Sharia law deal with questions or issues related to, to freedom of speech and freedom of the press today? <clears throat> Thank you. Sharia law is not standardized. It's not, it's not uniformly applied uh, in, in, in two different countries of the world. Sharia law in Saudi Arabia is very different from Sharia law in Yemen, though the countries are uh, ethnically, historically more homogenous than any other two countries in that part of the world. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, one cannot speak of, of a, a singular Sharia law that is universally applicable or universally applied. Uh, with regard to, the, to, to your second question about uh, what we consider today as being the, the, the primary elements of a civilized modern society, and that being the freedoms of speech, communications, interactions. These are not elements that are pointedly addressed in Islamic law, because the society in which the law itself emerged did not deal with those things. Uh, there are elements within, within Islam that provide support to such, to such ideas. The idea that human beings are free, the freedom to choose, the freedom to, to do so many things. Muslim scholars could not, could not find something directly, explicitly in the text, but then they, they found a, a, a discussion between a, a Muslim from Arabia and, and uh, the, uh, the king of, of uh, the Sasanian king. And he says, what is it that prompted you desert dwellers, Arabs that is, to leave the desert and aspire to imperial authority? What is it that ch changed people who had no aspirations towards this kind of, of global uh, exchanges? Why did you do that? And so he responded, he says, jitna li nukhrija. He says, we have come to liberate those who want. Liberate them from what? From subservience to fellow human beings to subservience to the ultimate God. So, so in that is found that spirit of freedom that, that Islam espouses. And of course, if one looks at Muslim theology, and its, its preoccupation and its insistence on human subservience to God alone. That, that, that is, is a, 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 a reservoir of, of, uh, of uh, evidence that Muslims have and can use to promote the idea that Islam too advocates freedom in much the same way as the world now embraces. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you very much for coming out here. I have a question regarding um, globalization in terms of the Islamic world, Islamic world specifically. You just previously pointed out that a, uh, the, the plausibility of something as a universally accepted and holistically applied document of Sharia in all the Muslim countries is a rather implausible thing at the moment. But do you think in the future with the advent of a, a, a Muslim organization similar to the UN or the European Union or a, an alliance of Muslim states, do you think such an endeavor would be possible then? And uh, my second question would be, and at this particular moment, would you like to elucidate on particularly why so, um, 
a, a universal application of Sharia is not very possible. Thank you. Uh, well, for one, uh, I'm going to kind of bundle both these questions up together because I think they're interrelated. I, I, I think it's fair to say that most Muslims are uncomfortable with the Sharia, and here by Sharia is meant not that divine, unimpeachable, cosmic reality, but the synonym for Islamic law. And, 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 and the realities of life today. Muslims themselves, whilst not disavowing the significance of Sharia as part of their, their system of beliefs, uh, find difficulty in embracing the historical renditions of that. Remember, we, the, the first points we made are, are, are pertinent to this, that that which is in the mind of God becomes a, an existential reality through, the, through human intervention. And that human intervention then uh, reduces the significance, the theological significance of the Sharia as well. If something is, is humanly tainted, then certainly it can be modified. And so there's this process of re-examining the, 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 the uh, parameters of the Sharia, and, it's, and it's, it's an ongoing process. From the most devout to the most secular Muslims are involved in, 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 in not, very few are asking that the Sharia be jettisoned in toto, that it be abandoned entirely. M many have come to realize, if not most, that Sharia is as much a part of, of Muslim culture and Muslim civilization and Muslim history as Christianity is of, 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 of Western Europe and the United States. And so therefore, when we look at the discussions that go on in this particular country with regard to the role of Christianity, Christian values, it is a discussion that is ongoing. It is highly contentious. So that kind of a discussion now, is now making its way into, into the Muslim world. People are asking, uh, what are, not, are, are less asking, does the Sharia have a role to play in our society? The question they're asking, to what extent is the Sharia uh, a part of our society? And who's, more importantly, whose interpretation of the Sharia will determine how my life will be conditioned on a daily basis. These are the major issues that people ask themselves. And in a world that is becoming truly global, tr truly plural, it's hard to imagine a, a religiously based legal system being operative exclusively within a particular country, Muslim or non-Muslim. So, so, so uh, the configurations of the Sharia in the next, for, the ne for the future are, are very, very interesting. They, they are, and, and, and uh, what, I find, what I find heartening is the fact that, if, that those who are, who are energetically involved in these debates are actually devout, committed Muslims, not those who simply look at uh, the Sharia as something archaic or at best something that ought to be reduced uh, to, uh, some, to the exotica. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for coming here and sharing your knowledge in this unique field. Um, you were talking about Sharia, the real Sharia, and the ideals of inclusiveness and human rights embedded in this type of law. Now, my question is, what has been the social, political, and cultural impact of the Sharia law in the life an experience of women and homosexuals. Thank you. Well, I'm at a disadvantage here. I'm neither. <laughs> uh, it has, Sharia is, is, Islamic law is reflective of the society from which it emerges, the society within which it functions. When we look at Islamic law with regard to women, from our perspective, and by our I mean our Western secular perspective, modern Western secular perspective, 
um, it, it certainly is less than on par. From a secular perspective, the average Muslim woman has fewer rights than a non-Muslim woman in a Western society. The average Muslim woman, from a secular Western perspective, has fewer rights than a woman in a Western secular society. But the average Muslim woman, when compared to the average Chinese woman, or when compared to the average African woman, or when compared to the average Hindu woman, may actually have more rights. I'm not saying it's entirely the case, or less rights. The point I want to make by, by giving you these examples is to, to highlight the fact that these laws are conditioned by the cultural milieu in which they embed it. No community has simply taken what was written in a text and use that and apply that literally without concern or cognizance of their context. Whether not, not the Islamic community nor any other community. Hindu law 40, 400 years ago and Hindu law today, are, is, is, are, these are two different things. Islamic law 400 years ago and Islamic law today, these are two different things. Remember when we said that there is an ideal that is the Sharia, but it is an utterly unattainable ideal because it is cosmic and it resides, resides in the mind of God. And then we have approximations of that Sharia through the process of fiqh. And that changes from time to time. It changes from period to period. We have abundant examples within traditional Islam of the law undergoing changes because of changed circumstances. So. And with regard to homosexuality, Islam is, along with Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, African culture, all of these traditional, defining term, traditional cultural dispensations generally all look at homosexuality negatively. So Islam, in, to that extent, is no different from any other traditional way of looking at the practice that you and I today know as homosexuality and which we in this country and in, in the West consider a form of social living that is no different from heterosexual social life. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Thank you very much for coming. Sure. I have certainly enjoyed uh, your talk. Uh, in some ways, my question is uh, somewhat similar to his. I have two, please. Uh, the United States Constitution, after certainly a very, very long struggle, uh, gives all people, in theory, equality. The Sharia does not. So isn't that an uh, insoluble problem? Uh, and again, I was thinking particularly about women and non-Muslims living in majority Muslim cultures. Uh, the second question is that the law in the U.S. is based on the idea that the human being makes the law. And therefore, the law can be changed as the society advances or thinks it has advanced. Uh, and the Sharia says that God is the lawgiver. So here we also have a major conflict. So as we talk about communities coming into the West, be it the United States or be it uh, Europe, where after tremendous struggles, people have fought to get equality uh, for everyone, including homosexuals and, and women, isn't it a problem for communities to come in and suggest that they should be able to live differently, yet within the rubric of that Western society that has struggled to attain the equal rights for everybody? Uh, how do I answer this question? The only way I could do that is by simply 
representing my entire talk. Because that's exactly what I was trying to say. I, I started my talk by telling you that the Sharia, as technically legally defined, is an ideal that is utterly unattainable. Then it has, it has social manifestations through the intervention of the human intellect, and that is the process known as fiqh, which varies from place to place and moment to moment. We have example upon example within traditional classical Islamic law of how the Sharia, which is, which again, I'm gonna say it for the third time, resides in the mind of God, is made a social reality through human intervention. And that human intervention socializes the law, and because it becomes so socialized, it is therefore susceptible to change and modification, as indeed it has been changed and modified through time. And one can go on giving example upon example upon example of how the Sharia has been. By here by Sharia, we mean the synonym for Islamic law has undergone changes. And as for the Sharia operating within a largely secular society, I've given you the example of India. I've given you, I can give you examples where there's talk of this in South Africa, places like Trinidad. There are several countries in this world today, in 2008, where Islamic law in some form is being applied and accommodated without any injury or harm to society at large. If societies at large elsewhere, and even in this country, I gave you the example of Islamic laws of banking. This is Sharia Islamic law that is being, that is being applied within this country, which is sometimes challenged in these courts, and which is nonetheless so recognized. So there is, one cannot talk of a, the Sharia being a foreign anomaly that is slowly or drastically coming into a country that has no experience in this. We have experience in this, I gave you examples of that, of Judaic law in New York. So, so <clears throat> this is what the Sharia really is. Assalamu uh, alaikum. A few, two questions. There was a call uh, a few years ago by uh, Tariq Ramadan, a famous intellectual from uh, Europe. He, he called for the suspension of the hudud in the Islamic countries. And uh, I guess one of his reasonings was that the uh, uh, segmentation of Sharia would be harmful to the overall uh, application. So how harmful is it to take just aspects of Sharia and apply it separately? The second is many of not only Westerners, non-Muslims, but also a lot of Muslims when they think of Sharia, they think of killings, beheadings, stonings, uh, cutting the hand. Historically, why is it that we have reached this level of thinking of Sharia in this context? Thank you. <clears throat> well, I like the second question so much, I'm going to spend more time on it. Um, Muslims, in particular, are responsible for that, in that they've taken all of what is Islamic law and reduced it to a few highly potent symbols. And you cannot cry foul after that. You cannot reduce Islamic law that pertains. What is what does Sharia pertain? What what what? How did how did the Sharia govern people's lives in earlier times? Well, let me give you a few examples. Uh, if you're building a house, you you needed a permit. This is now 1,100 years ago, in the city of Baghdad, in Damascus. You needed a permit, and you would not be granted a permit to 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 put a, a balcony in your house, except if that balcony was something like, um, I think eight feet from the ground up. This, this, is, this is Sharia, the much demonized 
and 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 uh, and uh, radicalized Sharia. This is a Sharia that 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 makes perfect sense to anyone who knows anything about building ordinances. Well, the reason they kept it at say ten feet was simply because they had to have sufficient distance for camels to go by, especially with the howdah in there, with the, with the, with the little box in. So they measure, it says the average height is somewhere from nine to 12 feet, so you're, you're, that this is how high it just should be. They had, they had another law that said, when farmers come into the city, people should not stop them on the street, outside the city, to purchase the goods they buy and then sell it inside agencies. We know, we know who, makes, who makes big money today. It's not the producer. It's not the retailer. It's the guy in between who, who, who provides, who makes no substantive contribution to the commodity itself, except to, to buy it from people and then sell it at, 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 a, at an inflated rate. There's actually a tradition of the prophet that says this is haram, very religiously uh, a clouded term. But it has to do with just average ordinances. And so there are literally hundreds of such rules that exist in this divine sharia that have to do with very pedestrian, normal things that you and I accept as being integral to a secular legal system. What Muslims have done over the past 100 years is taken certain aspects, the most radical aspects of the, of the Sharia, and reduced all of Islamic law to that. In the case of women, for instance, hijab. The only, the only aspect of the law that applies to a female is the extent to which she can uncover her body. With regard to non-Muslims, for instance, it is how to keep them as second-class citizens. With regard to the laws of, of, of Italian, it's the amputations of the hand and so on. So when you look at that, you can actually create a basket of, say, 10 or 12 legal injunctions that can be paraded around as, this is the Sharia. And I would challenge you to find the hundreds of, of injunctions and rules that are commonsensical, universal, albeit peculiar depending on areas in which people live that nobody knows of as being also part of the Sharia. These are equally part of the Sharia. But this is the one part that gets the most coverage and these are the parts that nobody bothers to look at. And that has come about largely because Muslims, Islam itself was demonized as being inhuman because it demands these particular injunctions, and Muslims s s sanctifying that, saying, well, no, this is not just not demonic, it is actually angelic or from God, and this is what it does to society, when, when in fact, when you look at how the law was looked at in earlier times, scholars understood that the law was a deterrent, and that the law had to be controlled and that it could very easily be abused. And so, for instance, none of these laws, even today, can be applied without the existence of a state structure. If there is no political authority, then the laws that apply to hudud, which is generally uh, the, most, the, the most talked about areas of Islamic law, these laws cannot be applied. On the other hand, there is today an emerging fringe of, of proselytizers within the Christian community in particular who are alarmed by what is, what is a response to, to the Archbishop's comments the other day in, in England, by the strength of Islam in terms of the, of the average Muslim's commitment to his faith and the weakness of the Christian community within England itself and so this alarm, alarmist reaction then, then forces them to reduce what they know to be something very broad and complex to its most egregious and most, most, most unacceptable uh, icons. When you have Sharia in, 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 in England, then you're gonna have the amputations of hands. 
That's not even allowed in Islamic law without, without the existence of a, a, a state authority. And what the, what, the bishop, what the archbishop was talking about was exactly the things that even American law is, is accommodating to a, to, a, to a great extent. That you have Muslims living here, they live, a, in, they live in two worlds at the same time, a Muslim world and a secular world. And, and, and if we do not address these things, we would not be doing uh, justice to their needs and their aspirations. There's, there's some wonderful examples of how secular courts have actually accommodated or addressed issues that stem from purely religious uh, communities. Good evening. Can you elaborate the um, privileges of uh, women in the Islamic society uh, in terms of protection and uh, respect because a lot of uh, the Western society is not aware of this uh, matter, please. Well, once again, I'm going to have to say that this, you're not talking about a monolith. There's, you cannot speak about, and, and unfortunately, every, every in educated discussion seems to focus on, in, on women in Islam in this ra rather stunted, myopic way. There are Muslim women who hold high positions of authority uh, and uh, who, uh, who are abused. And there are Muslim women who, are, who live simple lives who are not abused. It's very difficult for anyone who understands the Islamic community to accept that Islamic law has this direct impact. It is both two things about it that seem to stem from, 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 from such perspectives, that Islamic law has a direct impact on the lives of Muslims, and that impact is pervasive and universal. Both of these absurdities go as, 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 as being generally accepted knowledge today. It is neither direct nor is it universal. It varies from place to place, and if one has to do cultural parallels, then one would then then these things would become more sensible. One has to look at Muslim women living in Africa, and comparing them to Afri Christian women living in Africa, you would see greater similarities. What is happening now is that you're having Muslim women living in Africa being compared to Western Christian women living in downtown New York. Obviously, you're comparing two different societies. Compare Hindu women in India. To, Hindu, to, to Muslim women in India, then you're making a regional cultural comparison. But when you, when you do this kind of comparing one's ideals to someone else's realities, then you will have a, a, a constant mismatch. And if it is to score points, then so be it. And if it is to show that one society is better than the other, th that too. But if, you, if we re truly respect and understand the need to, un to, to work more cohesively in this global village, then we must look at the world in more than simply religious terms. Do you think uh, Americans or, American, or, or America in general has any, uh, can gain any benefit from the Sharia? I don't know, I, perhaps. American law is pretty sophisticated, and Americans, America is a society that prides itself on being heterogeneous and accommodating. And this is where the strength of this country lies. We, if, you have the, if you have something to contribute to this country, you're more than welcome. If your ideas are acceptable, then we will certainly play with it and then experiment it and and even adopt it. Uh, it becomes more problematic if that particular idea is demonized as being inherently anti-human. If all of the Sharia is inherently anti-human, then it makes no sense to, to, to brook any discussion with regard to the Sharia. But if it is part of our human legacy, and, 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 and it may well have certain elements that are of use, utility to us even today, then that's something we might want to consider. It depends on how we look at 
not just the Sharia, but Hindu law, African law, any other legal system or social phenomenon. If you look at them, if we look, if we look at all of these human constructs as part of humanity's legacy, then the, the, the likelihood that we would enjoy some benefit from such a legacy is far greater. But if we, if we, and Muslims do this more than do non-Muslims, if everything is reduced to purely religious terms, and, and, and that relig even that religious term is, is entirely cosmic, of everything that is outside the, the human realm, then no one's going to benefit anything from any religion or any community. Thank you very much.